This is Control Structure, episode 144, for May 24th, 2018. Big week to everyone listening. This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs144 to see them. I'm your host, Stephen Orvis, and with me is the other host, Andrew Bailey. Hi, Andrew. So, uh, how many days do you have left to live? Um, dire... I think... Something like that's fourteen, so that's fifteen, to six, like sixteen-ish. So yeah, like after that, things are going to be a little bit different for you. Oh, we, you know how the 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 joke is about uh, about sh- doing podcasts and things. Yeah, like you're not going to be here anymore. Well, of course not. That's how it works. Well, I mean, you haven't been to my place in like two months. No, I've been invisible. Yes, and, like, we've sounded very horrible. See, you sound really good on, on my end. I think it's the upload speed is, is why I sound so bad. Probably. It, it might get better after I am have my own personal internet connection. <laughs> out at your shack. Yeah, out at my shack. That <laughs> hasn't fallen over yet. <laughs> so, Raspberry? 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 Raspberry! I have people in the house. <laughs> yeah, um... So... Um, amazingly, the next door is still empty. So, uh... Oh, inside of your, your concrete home, Andrew, have you ever considered uh, setting up some sort of detection system for in case, like, a nuclear explosion happened nearby and, and you needed a warning to go run to your basement? Uh, amazingly, I have. Um, playing Fallout for hundreds of hours will do that to you. (laughs) It might be a sign of something. (laughs) Uh, Anyways, if that is an itch you have, you can get the uh, Pi... Chi? I'll call it that. Pi-Gi. Okay, that sounds cool. (laughs) The Pi-Gi, which is basically a plug-on board for your Raspberry Pi... Uh, to allow you to actually be have a Geiger counter, uh, so you can run around and detect things. I kind of like the screenshot down below. It showed the software and it shows like these stars, like zooming past you, kind of like the old screensaver from Windows 3.1. <laughs> I think Windows 95 had that as well, but yeah. Well, I don't know where it originated. I never checked Windows 1 to see what it had. Anyways, but yes, I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, let's see. It would also be useful not only in a nuclear situation, but also afterwards uh, to prevent you from becoming ghoulified. And, oh, I see. Yes, and that uh, you don't want that. So, um, Ubuntu 18.04 has been out for a little bit, and uh, it seems that many people prefer GNOME to Unity. So, uh, as maybe mentioned before... Uh, Unity has uh, pretty much been thrown out of the official Ubuntu development, and uh, GNOME 3 uh, has been brought in. You see, I I jumped on to GNOME uh, after not too much time when it was available because, uh, like when they started allowing you to choose, because my software, I believe it was Kurath, my yeah. slicing software, it needed it because it just wasn't being supported in Unity. Uh, so I made the jump then, and I was actually pretty happy. Like I was like, it's actually kind of cool. There was something with the... Hmm, I forget if it was the Win key. It's one of the actions I noticed. Like It's a little bit easier. And then the other big thing I, I noticed I use a lot is when I uh, push my mouse in the upper left-hand corner of either of my monitors, it pops out and does basically the, the pick-a-window thing, and I find that that's part of my workflow. Like I use that feature a ton. And I miss it when I don't have it. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, meanwhile, I will probably be updating both my uh, virtual machine and uh, my server downstairs uh, to Zubuntu 18.04. The spare parts machine that I built uh, is already running it, as is my uh, 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 laptop. Uh, My own laptop, not my work one. So... But, uh, yeah, what little I have used it uh, is great. It's just the same as it always was. 
so uh, I think we've mentioned BBR before, uh, Bottleneck Bandwidth and Round Trip Time. It's a TCP flow control algorithm. Uh, so it, you know, pretty much measures, uh, like the, how should I say, the, uh, was it the one, the transmission window and the, uh, uh, the latency, uh, in your TCP connections. So it kind of optimizes it to realize that, you know, as you are queuing more data to send, it realizes, oh, uh, the, uh, acknowledgements coming back are getting longer and longer and longer. So some point along the way, uh, it, you know, is like filling up. So it knows to reduce the uh, the send rate a little bit until it, you know, equalizes back out. Uh, so the problem is, is that this uh, flow control is so good that it hogs all the bandwidth to itself when shared among connections that uh, use other algorithms. So it's it hogs everything. Which is good if uh, all of the uh, connections on, say, uh, like your internet connection, uh, you know, uses it. But chances are, probably not. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure how far you got to, into this, but, uh, you know, pretty much analyzes, uh, uh, like, the existing cubic uh, flow control algorithm. And then once you, you know, start the BBR... Uh, connection like it hogs everything <laughs> like insane so i was i skimmed it. i was trying to understand like the difference so normally they have the if it's if it's dropping too much what does the other alg algorithms typically do versus the because the bbr usage just slows up a bit yeah so um turns out this might need a little bit of fine tuning <laughs> so mm -hmm. Uh, by the way, this was uh, made by Google, I believe, and uh, I think they pretty much use it for everything, at least on their server side stuff. Uh, but uh, you know, server side stuff uh, like Google Drive. Uh, so apparently, they are rebranding that, and uh, I think they might be stealing a page from Microsoft on this. That Google is renaming Drive to Google One, and uh, also. I think, uh, messing with their, uh, payment plans and everything. Uh, but yeah, we now have Google one. We have one drive, uh, along with box and Dropbox. Which... Wait, just wait till box comes up with box one. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe Microsoft will one have to... box. Well, that actually sounds pretty good. <laughs> or, uh, was it box three sixty five? <laughs> Oh, maybe that's what it was. <laughs> it could be, and I heard this the other day. Uh, sometimes when a company comes out with a new product or a new offering or a new name, that's a good time to readjust pricing uh, ways. Uh, so that very well could be a driving factor. Yeah. So, like, I remember uh, Microsoft had to get rid of their unlimited tier because people were actually using it uh, unlimited like, they're just putting everything into there, like backups and everything. So, um, you remember Adobe, right? Uh, the uh, Photoshop people? Uh, yes. That make the horrible PDF reader, too. Yes. Uh, do you know what Magento is? I do not know. Uh, Magento is a e-commerce uh, system, like platform or whatever. So it turns out that uh, Adobe has bought Magento. So uh, let's hmm. see. I'm trying to figure out uh, what, how much exactly. Uh, ah, for 1.68 Instagrams, uh, billion dollars for those uh, not in on the joke. So, so that's interesting that they are trying to get into that side of the business because they've always made. Uh, more of the software and tools and things and less... For designers. Yeah. Well, of course, I guess it does fit in, though, because they could bring their other tools and leverage it to maybe make a better experience for when people are using the site. I don't know. We're making, making content. So, uh, let's see. Adobe also has Flash, 
uh, whatever remains of that. In fact, uh, let's see, I wonder if uh, Wikipedia has uh, a list of, well, they have a list of products. Uh, let's see, graphic design software, web design. Uh, so yeah, Flash, uh, Dreamweaver, which hardly anybody talks about anymore. Uh, video editing, audio editing, uh, e-learning software, uh, digital marketing, uh, Adobe Marketing Cloud. Yeah, I remember those. Uh, server, uh, Cold Fusion. Uh, let's see, uh, formats, PDF, PostScript, ActionScript. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, kind of a weird addition to their portfolio, I guess. So uh, remember... Yeah. Uh, remember power processors, uh, like the uh, like the IBM uh, sort of big iron type processors uh, that are in no way x86 based. Uh, so uh, I think it was last year or maybe two years ago that uh, they were talking about uh, you know actually building sort of low cost systems for people to toy around with. Those are the ones that they're normally in mainframes, but the low-cost ones were for the devs, so you could have a $4,000 dev yes. machine. Aha. Uh, so speaking of which, the Raptor Talus 2 is now available for pre-order, um, starting at, uh, let's see, at least the base case uh, starts at $1,400. Uh so, yeah, it looks like you might be able to build something that's, well, let's see, with the cheapest processor, the lowest amount of RAM, uh, uh, GPU, I guess, uh, let's see, NVMe flash storage, 8-port uh, uh, SAS controller, 4-port SATA controller, uh, $3,700. Hmm. So that's expensive but not stratospheric yeah because i would say that it's fairly normal for developer machines to be pretty you know upwards of a thousand or two so i would i could see that being a reasonable thing if you needed it yeah so like i'd imagine that uh you know like some kind of enterprise shop would uh, get a few of these uh so in order to support uh you know things on like big iron i guess uh, so yeah, there's, uh, so let's see if you follow the PCI express standards, uh, PCI th PCI express three, uh, has been out for quite a while. And, uh, I, I'm pretty sure this is like one of the first PCI express four boards. Uh, so it also has, uh, like some sort of secure boot environment that's, uh, based on Linux. Oh, so it has like a pre-boot thing? Yeah, since it's not uh, like x86, like uh, like the firmware isn't really the traditional BIOS system mm -hmm. or UEFI or whatever have you. Yeah. So like the uh, like the boot environment is quite a bit different. Uh, I guess that's true that you'd have a different world there. Yeah, since like you're going outside of the... Uh, traditional Intel and Intel compatible uh, ecosystem. So yeah, this is exactly, I think this is exactly what this ecosystem needs. So like if you want people to, you know, get excited about your big iron, you know, let people play around with it. Uh, you know, like make it sort of cheap. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, this. It definitely makes a difference when you can uh, tinker with it versus, versus not kind of like with a, uh... Raspberry Pi is why there is the trend to cluster a whole bunch of them together because that gives you just the, the environment of a lot of processors. Even if you don't necessarily have supercomputer power, you still have a, the environment is the same. Yeah, like the same sort of basic architecture of a supercomputer. Exactly, yep. So, um, so speaking about exotic hardware, uh, I'm not exactly sure if you consider Cisco uh, things to be exotic. Um so uh, Cisco's software, uh, people have been picking at it for a long time, 
and it looks like more vulnerabilities have been discovered because they won't stop hard coding their passwords into all their programs. Uh, so uh, recently there has been 16 security advisories on Cisco software, uh, one of which was a critical, which received a maximum 10 out of 10 on the CVSS V3 severity score. So I love the, uh, the one, the one fly that says, uh, let's see here. Cisco describes this as an undocumented static user credentials for the default administrator account. Yes. Which is just a longer way of spelling backdoor account. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that was funny. But, uh, the interesting thing at, at the bottom, uh, it mentions that it's an internal audits that it's been doing and that it started back 2015 in December. Mm -hmm. So I, that's a good thing that internally that they're going through and they could be covering these up and saying, no, we don't have issues. But instead they're saying, yeah, we've found stuff and we're making it better. And uh, like, please update your stuff. Yes. And there's a good reason to update it. They're giving transparency, which is always a great thing. And that they're giving transparency tells me that they're fixing this stuff and they're serious about making it secure. Exactly. So the second one caught my eye. It mentions about authentication for Kubernetes, says which is an authentication bypass for Kubernetes container management system. And, oh, they have an embedded. Wow, I didn't know they had an embedded embedded way to host Kubernetes. Huh? Is that how you spell it, or rather pronounce it? That's what I've heard. I think, but of course, I've been known to sometimes. Uh, mispronounce things yes especially weird spelling things like that so i always thought it, it was pronounced kubernetes kubernetes yeah it could be so like that uh, that's... that's a good one to google later let's see let's see what, see what google says <laughs> google would know oh there's a there's a github issue about it on, on there <laughs> Are you kidding me? Oh, yeah. Here. I guess I think this is part of the podcast, though. Let me see. Where are we at? Here you go. <laughs> I see it. <laughs> it's a GitHub issue. Coop or net ease. That's what that guy says it. You can hear a recording here. Let's ask all the people involved to give their own voices. <laughs> oh, my sound's on a different speaker. Actually, this would probably create an ear gap when I do this. Kubernetes. Yeah, that guy says Kubernetes. <laughs> so maybe I was right. Huh. That's something I never expected to see on here. <laughs> yeah, how big you about it? <laughs> yeah, it's... I, I feel like I've seen in some conference videos or something, which is where I got that from, maybe... Uh, but yeah, I quite often end up reading words and saying something totally different. So that was interesting that I actually got that one right. <laughs> so um, now for something just as irrelevant, I think. The fifth hyperfactorial, that is 5 to the fifth times 4 to the fourth times 3 cubed times 2 squared times 1 to the 1 equals uh, the 86,400,000 milliseconds, uh, which is exactly the length of one day, or rather the amount of milliseconds in one day. Pulling up Wolf from Alpha because I don't trust anything. <laughs> like, actually, and this, uh, like... Yeah, one day. Yeah, it... Uh, how do I say this? There's like an explanation of like all the uh, factors that go into it. You know, one day has 24 hours, which is four times three times two. An hour has 60 minutes, which is five times four times three. A minute has 60 seconds, which is another five times four times three. Uh, and a second has 1000 milliseconds, which is five times five times five times four times two. So you, uh, you know, combine all those factors together. Mm -hmm. and that's what you get. That is pretty cool. So, 
Yeah, and uh, let's see. Don't forget to uh, use the contact form on the Nexus.tv to submit feedback, uh, maybe, uh, unless I finally figure out how to do that Reddit thing. Uh, and don't and don't forget that today is International Backup Awareness Day, so don't forget to back up your hyperfactorials. <laughs> and what have you put into the show docs? I put fringe items in. It looks like trees. Yes, I are fit these, them all in my... Are these your trees? Yes, I fit them all into my escape. Can you believe it? It looks like one had an accident on your seat. <laughs> It did. <laughs> and I had to drive it all the way home with the accident on the seat that the tree did. <laughs> How dare it. I Could, know. Couldn't, have, couldn't it have waited? <laughs> I guess it couldn't. It just, just couldn't wait. Uh, so, uh, looks like you're going to be uh, having some fun there. Yes. Um... Let's see, then meanwhile, I guess I will have to get some uh, guest hosts for this show. Oh, and yes. by the way, if you want to be a guest host on this show, go ahead and contact me. I may be reaching out to a few of you. Uh, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> this is uh, going to be a little fun and a little lonely, since I'm not going to be seeing you for a while. Well, sh should be more or less a month. <laughs> so... Uh, let's see. Then, uh, yeah, summer's already here, so yay. Yay. Uh, Snow's gone. Yeah, uh, that's not even, uh, you know, not even a thought in our minds about that. I did hear once that the guy that makes used to make the really famous farmers or almanac, that one time he was sick and he hadn't finished July up for the weather predictions, and his publisher was like, you gotta get this finished and he's like I can't I'm sick and the guy is like well what should I put down and he's like just put down whatever and the blizzard put down like blizzard and that year in July there was a blizzard <laughs> so that's how that became the famous almanac because he was right <laughs> uh let's see there there actually was something like that like was it like an 1816 or 1817 or something like, there was a huge volcanic explosion in Indonesia that pretty much dimmed the sun for, like, over a year. And, like, wow. th it actually... There actually was, like, ice and stuff in June. Ah, uh, so that might be the year then that, that was the story comes from. Yeah. I've never actually Googled it to see if it's true, but I keep passing on it because it's a fun story. Yeah. So, yeah, it it's not exactly out of this world, so... Um, so, yeah, I guess uh, stay frosty, and uh, <laughs> we'll uh, talk later. Okay, great to see you. Bye.